Jesse, you give me your title. Pat Sepulveda, S-E-P-U-L-V-E-D-A, Associate Justice. Donald King, uh, retired justice. All right, and we are ready anytime, Justice Palmer. This interview is being conducted as a part of the Appellate Court uh, Legacy Project, and the purpose of that project is to establish an oral history of the Appellate Courts in California through interviews such as this one with justices who have served on our courts. We have with us today Justice Don King, retired, formerly on the First District Court of Appeal Division 5 from 1982 to 1996. And welcome, Don. It's a Thank pleasure you. to have you here. Happy to be back. I thought we would start by going to the beginning, perhaps, and talking about your early life. And I noted in some of the biographical information that I was given that you were born here in San Francisco. And would it be fair to say it appears that you're a lifetime resident yeah, of San except, Francisco? Except for time in the Army. I've been here all, the whole time. And it did look like you did uh, go away for a little bit, though, at, at one point in college that you initially went to Auburn. Is yes, it, I thought I wanted to be a football player. Is that what it was? <laughs> I was going to ask you if it was a basketball scholarship that got you there. No, and uh, I should have known because when I was in high school, I broke something every year playing football. But uh, it was not to be. It was not meant to be. No. So you graduated from Lincoln, is that right? Lincoln Kansas High City? School, yes. And did you play football or basketball football. or both? Okay. So I'd heard about some of your prowess in uh, basketball. Yeah, well, that, uh, I focused more on basketball once I learned <laughs> it was football was football not for was me. So when you came back, you went to Auburn initially to college and then came back and went to USF to yes. finish up? Yes. And was that because of a, a change in focus? or? No, there was a family. Uh, my mother had an illness and uh, it turned out not to be uh, that severe, but I thought I'd better come back. And you ended up graduating with a Bachelor of Science then, yes. uh, from USF. And I understand you played basketball for the Dons for a while. Well, a little bit. Mostly when I was at law school. and uh, oh. I, was, I, I didn't play an undergraduate because um, I didn't care much for school at that point. And really, until I got to law school, I never cared for school. And so I graduated in three years. And I, to make it worthwhile to play, having to wait a year after transferring back, and then I would have only, it would only made sense if I stayed on for additional years. So I played against them, but I didn't play for them for at them. that point. Then later in uh, law school, I was uh, helping them uh, doing some scouting my first year, and then uh, was an assistant coach my second and third year. And in between the first and second years was uh, when they had won the national championship the second time. Then we I went. was going to ask if these were the great years of yeah. the Dons. Then they, uh, the State Department um, wanted to send them on a goodwill tour to play the Olympic teams in Central and South America. It was an Olympic year. So uh, the college eligibility rules in those days, you could only take people who had no other eligibility. Mm. So I was asked to go as a player. So that was the only time I really played for USF. But it was a wonderful summer, and I bet it uh, was. a terrific break between the first and second year of law school. Yeah, by the time I got to USF, they were not the great team no, that they once were, no. unfortunately. Well, this was still uh, this was the the Russell and Jones era. Right, right. Now you got your bachelor of science in 1952. Is that yes. accurate? And what was your your major? In? Accounting. Well, that served you well later yes. in life. And yes, it really We'll talk did. about that in a little bit, how that played into your, your later career. You did take some time in between college and law school and served in the Army. That's correct. And it looked like you had obtained the rank of first lieutenant uh, yes. during that time. Where were you stationed? What were you doing? I was drafted uh, during the Korean War, uh, went through basic training and uh, leadership school at Fort Ord, then went spent a terribly hot summer at Fort Benning, Georgia, going through uh, infantry OCS, Officer Candidate mm -hmm. School. Then I was transferred to uh, into ordinance and went to uh, uh, Aberdeen Improving Grounds in Maryland. I was there for almost a year. And then to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington for about a year and a half. Now, was there anything about that experience that made you decide you wanted to go to law school, or how did you Yeah, I had no school? plans to go to law school. I, I had been hired by a corporation out of uh, undergraduate, 
they knew I was going to be drafted in a short time, so it was really a, a, a real break for me that they even hired me. They treated me very well. They gave me some extra pay when I did get drafted. Um, so I always intended to go back, but when I was in officer candidate school, two of my roommates were from the East Coast were going back to law schools. And so they talked about it so much, and I figured I would, and I uh, had the GI Bill. I thought uh, it would be good in the corporate world, which is where I intended to return. And I really didn't uh, decide to practice law uh, as, a, as a practitioner until about halfway through law school. Hmm. And that was 1958 that you, you got your GA? Yes. And then you went into private practice here in San Francisco? Yes. And yes. I, I understand that you weren't doing a lot of family law, that, no. none at all? Or? Some, but not very much. Uh, I was um, I had a unique uh, situation. I, my law office was on the same block I grew up on. I'm sure I was the only, only lawyer in San Francisco That's with amazing. that distinction. I was, lived out in the, the West Portal area, and my office was on West Portal. I did, had a very varied uh, civil practice. Uh, I went there wanting to touch a lot of areas, trying to figure out what I wanted to do, and 17 or 18 years later, I was still there. So I did almost no family law. Uh, the last five years, I did almost uh, totally uh, engineering and uh, construction litigation. And then somehow in that same period, you got involved in politics, it looked like, quite yeah. a bit in the, in the 60s. And yeah. you were even on the uh, Democratic Central Committee for the... I was okay. chairman of the Democratic Central Committee from um, 1962 to 1960. Six. Is it true you beat out George Moscone for that? Uh, yes, by one vote. One vote. Yes. Wow. And the irony was that uh, the one vote was from his closest friend. Really? Yes. That's yeah. amazing. What led you to be involved in politics? Was there a particular reason why you got into uh, it? I think my wife probably got me into it as much as anybody else. My partner, my law partner, talked about it. We got involved. Uh, in 1959 in a, a local supervisorial race with a candidate who was very, very good, and he won. So we got very excited as a result of that. So it just led to that. Then I was on the Speaker's Bureau for the President Kennedy campaign. And it just went on and on. We had a, a group that I was involved with who uh, resulted in a number of people being elected to office. I wasn't interested in that. but. Uh, John Ferran became an assemblyman and a state senator. Leo McCarthy became uh, an assemblyman and then uh, lieutenant governor, speaker of the assembly and then lieutenant governor. Uh, Quentin Kopp uh, later became a state senator. Jack, Jack Artola and Ron Pelosi both became supervisors. They were all part of our, our group. Your group. So we had a lot of campaigns going on. Sounds like it. You mentioned your wife, that was Nikki, that yes. you, you married in 1957. Yes. And you had a son. Uh, Jordan Norman was born in 1970. That's right. Now, do you have grandchildren? At no, no, we're waiting. Still waiting. We're waiting. Does your son live in the area? He lives in Mill Valley. And has he gone into law as well? Or? No, no. He, uh, I think he saw me working too many hours. Found his own route in life. Yeah, and yeah. So he's, right now, he's the uh, office manager for a... Uh, commercial real estate office. Very good. And you were appointed in 1976 to the Superior Court by Governor Brown, Jerry Brown, Jr. Had you had contact with him and your, your political doings before that? Not or? really, no. Uh, uh, I was involved a bit in this campaign, but not in a very significant way because I was, uh, well, for one thing, I'd been helping Joe Alioto in, in the primary. <laughs> so it was in the fall that I got somewhat involved. Um, but uh, I had come close. Uh, I had a unique situation in uh, 1970 or 71. Uh, the, uh, I was being considered for appointment by Ronald Reagan. And actually, uh, my name went through the whole process, and the papers went on his desk to, to be signed, and then fate intervened. He uh, came down with the flu, and he was gone for three days. And in the meantime, the, he had had very few supporters when he ran in, for the 
first ran for governor in San Francisco in the primary because George Christopher, the San Francisco mayor, was on the other side. So he had a small band of very active uh, people. And uh, they, they had a candidate of their own who uh, he would not appoint because he was not qualified. And so when they couldn't get their own person appointed and they heard he was going to appoint somebody who had been chairman of the Democratic <laughs> County Central Committee, my name disappeared from his desk. I bet. But I, I knew I had a good connection, so I knew what was going on. And uh, in any event, so I, I had almost had the unique distinction of being appointed by two different governors, but one anyway. And that time on the San Francisco Superior Court, it looks like it was about six years before you were yeah, elevated? Yeah, six, six and a half years. And yeah. what assignments? I know you had family law, obviously. I had, uh, doing civil work, mostly civil trials, for about uh, eight months. And then I was asked to take the family law assignment, and then I, I just stayed with it. Uh, I did sit pro tem on the Court of Appeal for a couple months somewhere in there, and uh, that uh, was a wonderful learning lesson for me, and I felt that's what I wanted to do. I talked to the governor's office about whether continuing in family law would uh, hinder that, and they said no, so I just stayed with it. I liked it. I loved what I was doing. I found I had a um, an ability I n had never realized realized I would have to have an impact uh, outside of my own courtroom. And I was just uh, in the right place at the right time for a lot of changes that uh, came about. So really the majority of that six years was family law then yes. in the trial court? Yes. And there were changes I know that you effectuated in the family law system in San Francisco. Um, if you'd like to talk about some of those mediations, the one that comes immediately yeah. in, in custody cases to my mind. Well, when I first came on the the court, uh, my predecessor uh, had scheduled uh, three afternoons a week for hearings on temporary custody and visitation. And uh, uh, there were numerous trials, uh, I think, that primarily occurred because of those contested hearings on the temporary ones. It never made sense to me. I didn't know anything about mediation. In fact, I never heard the word at that point. But I knew we had some people over in the Family Court Services Office who I thought could help parents make their own decision, and I was absolutely convinced they knew more about their child than I did, and they could make a better decision if we could just give them the help to do that. So we started that as soon as I got in. I, I had a meeting with uh, a number of members of the family law bar. Uh, they were very supportive. They were kind of happy to have that removed from, from I'm sure their they work. Were. And so they were very supportive of it. We started it right away, and it was tremendously successful. Uh, did you do it by a local rule that required them to go through mediation? No, I just told just them they did. had to do it. Um, we did a number of things. I did a videotape with Judy Wallerstein, who was, in my view, knew more about the effects of divorce on children than anybody in the world. And we used to show that at the beginning of the session for those that had child-related problems. And that was a, a, a wonderful tool. In fact, at first we thought we had a uh, ma magic tool because the first day we had it, the only couple in there with child-related matters reconciled. <laughs> but but it, that was the only one. In any event, it was very helpful because, uh, as you would know from having been in family law, when parents are coming in for their first court appearance, they're so wrapped up in their own problems and what's going to happen to them and how are they going to get enough support or are they going to have to pay too much support or whatever it is that they're not focusing on the children's problems. So it was important to have something at the beginning of each session that sort of forced them to focus on their on children. The children. And uh, that kind of uh, got them warmed up. And then uh, once we started doing that, the mediators told me at first when I just sent them over, it was very difficult for them. But once we had a little program and the Judy Warstein tape was the best part, it was amazing what a difference there was five minutes later when they were over meeting with the mediator. This was a really revolutionary idea at that point, wasn't it, in California? Yes. Yeah, nobody was doing it, and uh, it was so successful. Then uh, Los Angeles picked it up, Fresno picked it up, and by the 1980, it was uh, a smash hit everywhere. Uh, in San Francisco, I'd have maybe two or three a year uh, 
hearings on temporary custody visitation and almost no trials. And then uh, by the time I came into family law in 1990, it was obviously it had been made mandatory. It was made mandatory by the legislature state. in 1981. Uh, it was, uh, no, I think it's the thing I'm most proud of in terms of accomplishment because I think it's helped so many people. There certainly are a certain number of people who don't want to be helped and you can't do much with them, but uh, I found that uh, no matter how much emotional conflict and anger, frustration there was between spouses, they love their children in almost every case. And if you can get them focusing on the negative effects of what they were doing on their kids, it was amazing what you can get them to do. I found you, you could, if you got them focused enough on their kids, you could get them to agree to anything with regard to the kids. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it was just amazing. And in fact, I see that now, and I, I don't do much, I don't do anything really in the way of custody anymore, but uh, I do a lot of mediation of uh, a whole range of issues, mostly in family law, but not all. And it's the same sort of thing. It's amazing to me. You start the day with a case that looks like it's impossible. We'll never get this case settled. And at the end of the day, it's settled. And it's just, a, it's a magical process. And I, I've never been able to figure out exactly why it works the way it does. But somehow talking through things with people, letting people express their own concerns, their own desires, uh, it's amazing what you can do. We were chatting just briefly before we started today, and I was telling you my favorite part of doing family law was doing settlement conferences. And it really seemed to be effective to work, if you could, at points with the parties themselves and yes. not do everything through the attorneys. It sounds like you're still doing I some did, of that. I do it both. I do it with the attorneys, but uh, I, as you know, there are a limited number of uh, attorneys who, hire the, who handle the higher end cases. So I deal with the same people essentially all the time. And uh, we end up being a team, really. Uh, there's no uh, no need for them to posture for their clients. Uh, there's no need to uh, become aggressive or argumentative. Uh, it's done in a calm way, and it um, it's productive. Uh, and they, I think, over time, if if they didn't know at the beginning, they certainly know by now. After 11 years, it just works. And uh, if we all work together. We'll get things resolved. It's I I normally have now open at any one time 45 to 55 family law cases because I do I get assigned as a judge pro tem at the beginning and I have the case from beginning to end. Out of those, I may have one trial a year, and that's usually an issue like spousal support. Uh, once in a while, a prayer van camp. Uh, allocation of separate community property in a, in a business. But the rest of them, we all get settled. And it's, it's a matter of working with the people. Uh, unfortunately, settlement conferences in the court too often are directive in telling people what they should do. And here, we work with them to uh, just help them reach their own decisions. And again, I found the same thing I found with the child custody and visitation mediation. If you, if you give people help, uh, and, and, and they want to be helped, most do, uh, then uh, it's amazing how you can do it. I think the, the change from no fault took a lot of years to, for people to realize the courts weren't going to allow people to fight anymore. And once you get past that emotional stage uh, and people are realizing how important it is to, for the past to be passed and they should be looking forward, that uh, you, can, you can help them. It's one of the reasons why I stayed so much in family law, because I felt it was the place I could provide more help to litigants than I could anywhere else. It is one of the, the few areas, I think, where you have that direct kind of impact yeah. on people's lives that much. And it sounds as though the accounting experience, at least probably in the trial court level, would have assisted in doing these family law cases. I remember listening to accountants endlessly, it seems, sometimes on some of these cases and writing opinions, uh, decisions in the cases involved doing some yeah. some accounting. Well, as you know, these days, with certainly with the higher end family law cases, there always is or are two forensic accountants. And uh, again, there's a limited number of those people who do that kind of work. So I deal with them all the time. 
my own experience in accounting has helped a lot. But frankly, much of it, uh, again, we help the accountants help the parties and resolve things. Uh, in my system, the accountants have free access to each other. They don't go through the attorneys or the parties. And um, what we end up with is a narrowing. They end up narrowing any issues regarding accounting disputes. Usually they're, uh, for example, if it's a uh, claims of reimbursement, they've narrowed it down so that there's only a few that are in dispute. And then it's a question, who's, it isn't the money, it's who's charged with this? Is it a community? Is it this person, that person? And of course, on the um, on goodwill issues and uh, the Pereira Van Camp, they're, they're very helpful, even though they, if they end up at a hearing, they're going to be in an adversarial position. They're very helpful in narrowing, narrowing the issues. And do you bring the accountants in on the settlement conferences? Yes. I used to do yes. that as well. That was very helpful. Yes. And, uh, and they are helpful. In fact, in some cases, there are a couple of them who are uh, is it at least as helpful, maybe more helpful than the attorneys. Uh, they're, they're, uh, they're a real resource, uh, not only for their clients, but for, for the court. Now, was it during those years on the trial bench that you started really teaching procedure? I know you taught for three different law schools, it looked like Hastings, Golden Gate, and USF law schools. Yeah. Was it during this period that you really started um, in education? Yes, I just, I started shortly, I did a lot of stuff with seizure. Uh, I'd been in the family law assignment for about a year or so, and I'd get these announcements of a uh, juvenile court judges institute or criminal law or civil or whatever it was. And Paul Lee was the head of seizure at that point. And I called him and I said, I don't understand why we don't have one for family law judges. And he said, that's a good idea and you're in charge. So how, we, how it always happens, right? <laughs> so that was the first one and it was a, it was a very interesting experience. We had it, it was in Newport Beach in a hotel uh, that had a unique setup. It was a kind of an open courtyard hotel and what that hotel did was to provide free drinks from five to seven to people who were staying in the hotel and some hors d'oeuvres. And so we'd put our program on and then everybody would congregate in the evening at the uh, lobby and there'd be, in effect, two more hours of uh, education and, and a lot of good interaction, which was helpful. So that's what led to uh, Seager ultimately having uh, wine and wine and cheese at the end of their oh, really? programs. Oh. They never did that. They used just have the program and it was over. That, that first program was terrific. It led to the first creation of uh, outside of Los Angeles in family law departments in Alameda, Sacramento, and and Santa Clara counties and Orange County hmm. that they'd never had them before. So it was a uh, it was a terrific success. It was a, a, a wonderful thing because in so many of these counties you'd have one judge or two judges who were doing it even except for LA and they had no contact with anybody else and to get together with others who were doing the same thing on a statewide basis to exchange ideas and how do you do this and what do you do when this happens. It's terrific experience. And this idea of the uh, uh, of a couple hours after the program was over in a relaxed atmosphere, exchanging ideas was great. It was terrific. Sometimes program. that can be the best part of yeah. the program. Yeah, because too many of those programs, as you know, are not. They're doing better now. They they weren't historically. They were not interactive. And people just sat there and That's somebody true. spoke. Right. Uh, maybe there was a panel, but often it was just one speaker. So. Um, that, that led to um, a series of those, and I was always involved in them in some way. And then when they uh, began the uh, their advanced course, I've forgotten what they call it now. The, CJSB, Continuing yeah, Judicial C Studies Program. Anyway, uh, Billy Mills, who was on the LA Superior Court, and I were asked to put that program together for family law. And that was terrific because you had a small group of people. It was totally interactive. Uh, and uh, from that, we, we got a lot of people really interested in working in family law as opposed to just going in and getting out as quickly as they could. 
there was one point in time where family law was kind of the dumping ground yeah. where the new judges would be. Unfortunately, out. still the case Is uh, it? all too often, yeah. A lot of things have gone downhill. The, uh, the mandatory mediation program is a disaster now. Uh, hmm. There used to be that uh, now in most counties the, media, the court mediators are limited to one hour in meeting with the parties. There's no way you can make a recommendation or help them in one hour. I didn't realize yeah, it's it's terrible. Changed. It's just terrible. And it's financing, I guess, like everything else. Well, that judicial educational component where you, when you first started, wondered why there wasn't a family law institute now is mandatory for yes. family law judges within a certain period of time yes. taking the assignments. So. And the advanced course is terrific for those going in. I, I'm not even sure it's called advanced, but it's not as, not as advanced. But and when did you become involved with seizure? You co-authored, um, I suppose, is the right term, is the treatise on family law for Rudder? Um, Seeger, I think it. I think it really started with that first family law program, um, because at that point there was a there was a, a well, there is I guess still a division between educational programs that Seeger was putting on, and that the judges association was putting on, and I was very much involved in the judges association programs. But but from that start, I always always involved every year uh, in the uh, Seeger family law judges institute. Uh, almost always on the program and almost always on the planning committee. So uh, that was, um, that continued on until I went to the Court of Appeal and actually occasionally after that. And when did you first become involved with the uh, Rudder publication? Um, I had been on some Rudder programs, uh, again, family law programs, and uh, in 1980 or 81, they had, uh, invited me to become a co-author of the, their practice guide on family law. The, um, uh, and I was happy to do that. I, I didn't know that I would be doing what I ended up doing when I was on the Court of Appeal with a lot of family law stuff, both at the teaching and the doing other programs. So I was concerned whether that was going to had me kind of out of touch with things, but they didn't seem to feel that was any problem. So I, I did that, and uh, that's been very successful. That book is uh, the book most used by family law attorneys in California, and we write it in a way, and we get positive feedback about this all the time, so that family law lawyers and family law judges uh, have an easy time getting right to what the issue is, finding what is to be said about the issue they have before them. That's our goal, and, and we think we meet it. Still uh, sits on my shelf and gets used yeah. in almost every family law case. Well, we've now had the experience of uh, there are two uh, Rudder Group books, the Weill uh, uh, Brown book on civil practice before trial, and now the Hokoboom King book on family law, where they I'm, I'm the only survivor. The others are three gone now. They have bought the rights to use our name, so they're going to have those books like kind of like the Whitkin thing. Hmm. They will, those books will be forever known as Wild and Brown and Hogan Boom and That's interesting. Because the citations so much have been toward it's that. That's true. And uh, there's been such an identification. So that's, uh, that's nice. That is. It'll be there forever. I thought Judge Hogan had passed away, so yes. I, I wondered about that. Now, in 1982, when you were nominated for the appellate court, one of the things I was reading said so that you got a record, something like 423 letters of support to the yeah. Commission on Appointments. Yeah. That really is phenomenal. Phenomenal. Number. Well, uh, a lot of it was from, I, I'm not even sure anymore what the breakdown was between lawyers and judges, but I, in the family law field, I had a lot of contact with both. And um, because of having done some of these things, I had, there was a lot of positive feedback. And so I think that's what uh, generated that. It was very nice because it's uh, with busy people. It's nice that they take time to sit down and that's true. write such a letter, especially the positive letters. Yes. And you also, though, were found extremely well qualified, as I as I recall, for the position. Which yes. Is also, a yeah. great honor to have that 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 yeah. level of qualification. I, I was the only one. I don't know why, but I was the only one. 
And this was for a newly created position? Was this when Division Five was yeah. being created yes. initially? Yes. And who were your colleagues then when you first came uh, Harry Lowe and uh, Zern Haney. We, we all started together. Uh, Zern was there the entire time I was there. Harry left uh, maybe a year, two years or three years before I left. So we had a, we had a, uh, a very congenial group and uh, we worked well together. Sounds like a good group. Well, when we went there, the part of the reason that division had been created was there was a tremendous backlog in uh, the first developed district. And in fact, I remember one lawyer telling me uh, she uh, she had a case before the first developed district, and she got a letter directing her to appear for oral argument in San Diego. And she couldn't figure out what was happening. What had happened is they had transferred some cases out, and they mixed up in not getting the notices of transfer out. So anyway, there was a considerable backlog. Mm. When we first came, we were assigned a, our proportionate number of cases, but we were given all the old cases. And what we found was that we had uh, cases that had been fully briefed for two years or more, uh, where the trial had maybe take place four or five years before. It was just terrible. How does that work in family law? That well, it wasn't just family law. This was everything. Mm. Uh, so what we did, uh, we decided the, the most expeditious way we could handle that was to divide between the three of us subject matter areas. That's partly, or at least in the early days until we got current, that's what caused me to have so many family law opinions. Well, I was going to ask you that because in eight years here I haven't seen that many that I personally yeah. got. And well, I took all the family law, I don't remember what I took. I took the family law cases and I took one or two other categories. Zern Haining took the tort cases and some contract cases or something. Harry got stuck with indemnity cases. Uh, but, but we each, we took a, and then what would occur is we'd get all of the cases, all of these old cases in our different subject matters in our own chambers. And what you'd find is if, uh, in the family law cases, for example, you might find um, eight cases that have essentially the same issue. And so uh, we were able to produce more opinions than any of the other divisions because of the way we were operating. And we operated from the very beginning in a different way too. We, the minute, at least once we got caught up, the minute a case became fully brief, it went on the next month's calendar. So um, these cases, as, lo as soon as we got a group together and knew what we were working on with those, we would put them on the next month's calendar. So the, the calendars were, were quite large. Uh, while we were getting caught up because we did have groups of cases with similar issues. And uh, it was an interesting process in oral argument because uh, sometimes we could pretty well give some direction as to where we were going and it was helpful then to the others in the courtroom we had the same issue. But that's what, that's what started that uh, uh, after we got caught up, which uh, I think would have been about uh, 85, something like that, about three years. And then we just, then we started doing everything just in regular rotation. Though I still got a number of family law cases, but the others had them too. So there was no more specialization, no. so to speak, after that? No. Uh, and then it was around that time that I approached uh, Chief Justice Byrd about going back to the Superior Court to help them out. And um, I couldn't uh, convince her to let me do that because uh, she felt I could only do it if somebody else came up and replaced me. And I said, no, I can do, do both. So, um, that, so the result was I didn't uh, do that until uh, Malcolm Lucas became Chief Justice. And uh, it shows you some difference between the two of them. I ran into him in the garage a couple of days after he'd been sworn in told them what I wanted to do, and that afternoon there was an order giving me a blanket assignment to the Superior Court. So how often would you go back? Well, at first I went back for two weeks every other month because what I thought I would do is, is try family law cases. But I found out very quickly that almost all of the family law cases ready to be tried should never have gotten that far. They should have been resolved much, much earlier. So that's what made me start doing what is really a case management process with 
minor modifications identical to what I do today. So I went over to, uh, then, I, then I decided to, to change it by going over on some order show cause days where lawyers and clients were given an opportunity to come to me if they would agree, I would explain to them what I was planning on doing, and if they would agree to have it assigned to me, then I just took the case from beginning to end. That worked out very well because I, I took about uh, 45 or 50 cases, and um, somewhere between 10 or 11, 12, we settled the first day, got everything all done. Um, the others, none of them ever went to trial. They all got settled. It just um, made it clear to me there's a better way to do things than the adversary system. So uh, in effect, uh, then w once I did that, I couldn't, uh, uh, I couldn't continue doing it the same way because there was such an ebb and flow I had a point where I had no cases or down the no cases and how did I get some more how did it work so then what I started doing was taking higher end cases and uh, uh, they would be assigned to me and I found and that started this way a very interesting experience I was I was over there helping them out occasionally and the presiding judge called me one day and said we've got a difficult case Will you take it on and see if you can resolve it? And I said, sure. So I got over there to, for what was supposed to be an initial order to show cause, and it was Melvin Belli and his wife. And they didn't have a courtroom for us. They had a whole bunch of issues. They didn't have a courtroom for us. So they put us in what in the old city hall was facetiously called the judge's lounge, which was a room just about this size, very small. It had a small round table in there, and some chairs. And so we went in there. He said, go in there because we don't have a courtroom available. So we all went in there and sat, and then, th then they said, we're going to have to wait. We don't have a court reporter available. So we waited and started talking. And by the time the court reporter came 15 minutes later, we had it all resolved by agreement. And these were difficult people. That's amazing. He, used, he uh, was no more difficult than she was. They were both very difficult people. So it became clear to me that, the, that a mediation approach was much better. To get them involved, let them participate, let them be telling us how the case should be set up and working within that framework. Finding where the party's positions were, not having to decide anything in terms of who's right or who's wrong, but where within the, the uh, extremes of their positions can you reach a point of getting agreement. So that's what I did from that point on. I took higher end cases, took them from beginning to end, and provided uh, case management, which is mainly monitoring things, but it also involves, uh, I, I set up my own rules. Uh, for example, they, nobody could file a motion without calling me first. I, first of all, I, the exception of the public system, uh, which I always explain to them that is contrary to public policy, is that I can have ex party communication with anybody, including the parties. So one of the rules I had was that before an attorney could file a motion, they had to call me and get my approval. And the result was we virtually never have any motions. Uh, the, and then the files, essentially the court files, are the petition, the response, and a judgment and an MSA. Hmm. There's no paperwork. We ignore virtually all of the statutory procedural rules because we don't need them. We don't need to have the follow the rules for setting a motion because the way we do that is we have a conference call and say, okay, what's a good day for everybody? And then we do it. So how many of these cases, when you got to this point of doing the bigger end sorts of cases, were you handling a year? I was, uh, it was hard to say because they would go on for varying periods of time. Um, they, uh, I usually would have about three or four of those at a time. And you uh, continue to do that until you retired? Yes, and after. And after? I still do the same thing. Do you? Yeah, I just have larger numbers now. But uh, it's the same thing. Um, I had a meeting this morning with the one client and a, his attorneys uh, on a big, big case, which has uh, got a lot of complications to it. It's a prayer event camp case where a 
business has been sold for many, many millions of dollars. Um, and uh, from that, some th threatening action that the other attorney was going to take, which he, which I can't stop him from doing, filing a lease pendant on what in, in essence is a, a commercial real estate business. Uh, what came out of that, I, I then called him afterwards and talked to him about the meeting and the result is he agreed to uh, not do that and solve a lot of problems for the husband who would be in a terrible position if he can't do anything in terms of refinancing or mm -hmm. anything else without getting court approval. So, and I, I did that in other ways too. Um, uh, in the Belli case, uh, the nature of the Belli law office was they had huge cases, brought in huge fees. But the fees disappeared the moment they came in and there'd be uh, huge accounts payable. So uh, I ended up acting as an unofficial receiver, really. No court order, no nothing. And just on every Friday, they would tell me what money had come in during the week and what, how they, what they intended to do with it. And if they didn't hear back from me by Wednesday, they could go ahead and do that. And that's the way we operated. With very rare exceptions, I usually said yes. You must be one of the few appellate justices in the state that really, on a regular basis at least, was continuing to do this kind of sitting on assignment in a, in a trial court. Yeah, I think I was. Mark Boche uh, ended up doing it after I, uh, Did he? my model. He was going back though just doing trials. Uh, I think Doug Swagger, for a, a period of time at least, was going back was once a year and doing yeah. a little bit of trials. Yeah. No, it's, uh, that's very important. Uh, I think uh, one of the problems with the Court of Appeal is it's, and this is especially true, I think, for lawyers, with all due respect, who came out of public offices. They, they don't have the same kind of responsibility to satisfy clients. They don't have the same uh, overhead expenses of a secretary in an office and so on. And I think uh, it's, it's an important experience to, to, to not get so far away from it that you forget what goes on and the way it goes on. So I, I always thought it would be a good idea for all uh, appellate court justices every four or five years to go back for six months and, and do it. It's, a, uh, it's so easy. I don't view the Court of Appeal as an ivory tower by any means. And it, it has a lot of benefits to it that you don't have at the trial court, particularly the interaction with colleagues on difficult issues. But, but I think it does have a tendency, if you're here for too long, to unless you really work at it, to forget what's happening. And not only with regard to lawyers and their clients, but in terms of looking at what judges do. I mean, sometimes you it's too easy to say, how in the world could this person have done this? One of the things I always appreciated about your opinions on the Court of Appeal and family law, first of all, I appreciated that they were coming from somebody who had actually done family law as a trial judge. And that's relatively unusual, Very it was unusual, in those yeah. days. And then the fact that you were still going back, and so you, again, had maintained that touch yeah. with what happens in a, in a court and what a trial judge is really facing and heavy calendars and warring parties. And yeah. I did one other thing with my opinions uh, from the very beginning, and I think I was pretty unique in doing this too. I always used the first paragraph to give the full holding of the case. Um, if nobody wanted to read beyond the first paragraph, that was okay. But uh, it, uh, to avoid uh, misstatements in terms of what the case was saying, because in a lot of instances, certainly in the family law cases, I was writing them only partly to decide the case and just as much as an educational component for lawyers and family law judges in terms of how to handle issues and ways to do things. Well, it was interesting. I was chatting with Jim Libby uh, before this interview and Jim's been a family law commissioner for oh, a very long time in Contra Costa County. And he said that Don King opinions in his opinion, were frequently had dicta in them, but that the lawyers and the judges that had been practicing in these areas and family law for some time appreciated that yeah. because it really gave you some idea of 
how to handle cases and how to apply the law that you were actually ruling on in the case. And it, and it was especially important during the time that I was here, again, because uh, family law changed. The Family Law Act passed in uh, 71 and no fault went out or came in. Uh, certification of family law lawyers started in the late 70s. Just, that's why I say I was in the right place at the right time in a lot of things. And opinions were just coming out in, starting in the late 70s, but in the 80s. And so uh, it was a, really a propitious time for me to do use them as an educational tool. Um, I think the, I, I never distinguish between cases that, uh, or opinions in which I wrote on any case, but I was particularly, I had a case called Marriage of Cream. I was going to say, I was going to talk to you about Cream in that regard. Yeah, Cream was the, the case of the only privately owned geyser in the United States. And um, I used that both for my own knowledge, but also talking to family law judges around the state to have an appendix uh, giving 12 or 14 ways that you can resolve issues by agreement as a tool. But it was an example of what I tried to do, really, in every opinion, because the, it was it was a. Uh, I I thought it was if I, what I was doing was deciding it for these parties, then the case might well not even be published. Well, I think that cream opinion as well is an example of what I was speaking to, where you obviously had the experience in family law, of having parties that want to potentially bring into court and have a judge decide how to divide the pots and pans. And yes. Or my favorite when I was doing family law was how do you divide the golden retriever or who's <laughs> going to get custody of the golden retriever. And you recognized yes. in that opinion, even though you found it was improper to force the parties to uh, get in a bidding war and an auction between themselves for the geyser, that there were all these methods that by agreement at least between the yeah. parties could be used creative ways. Yes. And I think that's a deficiency in the system that there's most judges are so busy they don't have time to think about creative ways of doing things and I think there are there are ways that we can help lawyers get their cases settled and that's um, that's we're down to our benefit and that may be one of those areas where the cocktail hour continuing education part of the program gives the judges the opportunity to yeah. really talk about these kinds of things yes other than the cream opinion what other opinions do you remember that you thought were particularly important in the family law arena that you authored? Do any come to mind? I, I don't uh, distinguish between them, really. Um, now, were Richmond orders kind of your creation? or I was the trial judge in Marriage of Richmond. Were you? So I, um, I used that uh, as a tool which I thought was very useful in certain circumstances. Uh, the circumstances in that case were that uh, Mrs. Richmond had uh, seemingly become a, a lifetime student. And uh, although she kept saying she was going to finish her postgraduate work and become a teacher, I think, it never seemed to happen. So um, I asked her on the stand to give me a time by which she would finish her work and what time beyond that she would need to get a job. And then I just incorporated that into the Richmond type order where unless she showed, I gave her the time she asked for and uh, provided that at that point uh, spousal support would terminate, jurisdiction would terminate, unless prior to that date she made a motion and showed good cause why it should be extended made a lot of sense and it's very useful I think especially in uh, shorter medium term marriages uh, especially in, in cases where uh, uh, the parties are in the 30s the one spouse usually the wife is the kids are old enough now that teenagers uh, wants to go back to school and yet uh, it provides some incentive to do things by a given period of time, and it's good for the um, for the one who's paying also because it gives them some light at the end of the tunnel, and it puts the burden on the supported spouse to show why things have not developed the way she usually it's she have anticipated, so that they're not shut off from getting support beyond the date set, but they've got a burden of proof. And that's where it belongs because the other side never has 
enough information or insight mm -hmm. to uh, to shoulder that. Yeah. So Richmond was a, one of the things I did in the trial court, and then uh, affirmed by the the first district here. And again, another example, I think, of a creative way of yeah. trying to approach some of these. I just had, for example, last night. I just had a. I've got a very difficult case with very difficult people with a lot of money. They've got a very expensive house up for sale, uh, probably 15 or $20 million house. They are battling every step of the way in terms of how it's to be done. The realtors who are handling it can't do anything without the approval of both people, and these are not two people who agree on anything. One of the most difficult cases I've ever had. Uh, and uh, so in a telephone conference call for about an hour or less, yesterday afternoon, an hour and a quarter, uh, finally got them to agree to the attorneys agreeing to a person to be appointed as a third party, kind of like a receiver but not officially. And that person would be responsible for all dealings with the realtor in terms of what painting has to be done, what has to be fixed, uh, and so on, as to everything other than an ultimate uh, question of whether an offer is accepted or uh, countered or whatever, then that's up to the parties. So it gets them both out of this, it gets them both out of the realtor's hair. Uh, and it's again, it's a different way of doing things that uh, I don't think it'll be burdensome. These people can afford it, but I don't think it's even going to be costly because it may require one or two phone calls a month from the, whoever this person is and the mm -hmm. realtor to say, I've got a bid this much for some painting that needs to be done. Send me the bit, and I'll tell you whether it's okay. Not going to be a big deal. Um, it sounds like you're we still really enjoying doing this, oh, yeah, this part true. of the well, business. Well, this is partly why I like dealing much more with the parties. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the problem when you're on the bench, whether it's certainly at the trial level, uh, you don't have access in the same way. Uh, and motions have to be filed because there's no way to get a resolution. For example, you you saw, I'm sure, in, in the custody timeshare era, someone either is always picking up the child late or bringing them back late or not showing up at all or whatever. So that person who's disadvantaged by that calls their attorney. That attorney calls the other attorney and says, well, I'm sure that didn't happen, but I'll talk to my client. Well, he told her he wasn't going to come, I mean, and there's no solution to it. Whereas these telephone conference calls that I have, or individual calls in that kind of instance, solves the problem. It's just, uh, it's, it's a so much better way of doing it. It's one reason why we avoid all that paperwork. Mm -hmm. We rarely have, uh, I had my first discovery motion in uh, nine years earlier this week. Really? The first one that actually came to a point of wanting to be heard as a motion. So it, it just, uh, it makes it much easier, much less expensive. Mm -hmm. the lawyers tell me even with the outrageous amounts that I charge for my services, it costs the clients less than if they were in the public system, the free public system. How many it's cases terrible. do you think are going out then to? Tremendous numbers. I don't know, I don't think there are that many other family law cases, although there are uh, an awful lot of, um, there's at least one lawyer who does uh, what I do full time in San Mateo County. There are uh, at least another uh, eight or ten lawyers I know who do a lot of private judging in family law cases in the Bay Area. Uh, there's one in Marin who does it almost full time also. I think there's so at just, least one in Contra Costa. Yeah, so there's a, uh, there's a lot of it. And when you get into the civil area, uh, between people at uh, the American Arbitration Association, where I work through, and JAMS, they're probably, in, just in the Bay Area, there probably are uh, at least um, somewhere between 10 and 15 people who are working full time. Are you doing exclusively family law? No. No? No. I do mostly, almost all family law, but I do a lot of, I also do a lot of arbitration, and those are civil cases, usually contract disputes. Um, and I do some other uh, mediation works in other areas. I, do, I have a case now where, I, and I've had several over the years in uh, probate cases. 
it also works where you get family disputes going on, uh, often kind of tearing the family apart now that the controlling person of the family has died. And this may be a reason why we're seeing, I think we're seeing, a lot fewer of the family law cases, at least that are bigger in cases and have a lot of issues in them here in the Court of Appeal. It may be because yeah. a lot of those are going out to private judges. I think so, but I think it's also true with civil cases. The, uh, when I ran into judges from the San Francisco Superior Court, they complained that we're taking all the good cases. Yes, they do. They, they talk to me about that yeah, at lunch frequently. And they, and they, they, all they get are asbestos and unlawful detainer actions, they say. Uh, so I, uh, and I think it's true, but you know, it's a deficiency in the system. The system ought to be providing mediation because that's what these cases want. They don't want litigation. The costs of litigation are too great. It takes too long to get it over. They want mediation. So that's why they go to JAMS or they go to AAA or Southern California or ARC or whatever the other one's called. They want something that the court system doesn't offer and they're willing to pay a lot of money for it. And of course, the, I guess the negative argument about this is that it's only the rich that can afford to go to you and, and get what they may need. And That's true. Everybody else is stuck in the, in the trial courts. That's true. But if uh, these, what these lawyers tell me is correct, that it costs their clients less to do it that way than to go through the regular system, it's, it makes sense. And I think it would be true for uh, uh, moderate cases also. Uh, I fully believe one of these years we will have a, um, let's call it a law firm, a group of lawyers who get together and who will mediate medium-sized cases on a very inexpensive method and do it full time. So they don't need the same kind of malpractice insurance coverage, they don't need staff, they don't, in fact, the mediation, you don't even, it's helpful to have a computer but it's not critical. Uh, and just have some nice office space that they can share and that they will. The lawyers love doing mediation. These ones who are doing it privately, they just love doing it and they'd like to do it full time. Everyone I know who does it would like to do it full time. And I think that'll happen one of these days and it can be done uh, in a way that is not too costly. But again, the, the, the public system ought to do it. Uh, they the Continuing Judicial Studies program three or four years ago, I guess now, had a mediation program in they it. Did. And they were going to expand it the next year to also have one for family law. And then finance has caught up with them and they didn't do it. And I think they've cut off the first one. Really? No, I, don't I think, think they have. Yeah. I don't think they have the mediation. And yet that's, what, that's what's wanted. Mm -hmm. That's what the lawyers want. That's what the parties want. And in family law, as you were talking about, that's what makes sense. Yes. But I think it's beyond that, Pat. I think it's the, the whole system. I don't know about criminal, and I don't know that much about juvenile. But in probate and in civil cases, that's what people want. And the thing that's remarkable about them is you get cases settled that way. Mm -hmm. It's early intervention. It's before they've got huge investments in. And uh, you're, helping, you're helping them in a way that the adversary litigation process doesn't. And hopefully by having the parties reach an agreement, rather than having it go to trial and having a winner and a loser, Works much you better. lessen the continuing hostility, better. which, as you know, in family law, some of these cases go yeah. on forever. Yes, and uh, it does. There's no question about it. When they've reached their own agreement, it's amazing how they'll bend to the breaking point to, to comply with it. But, you know, in the civil side, uh, once you get away from, well, certainly any kind of business litigation cases, they usually are people who have ongoing dealings with each other. They don't want to get into big, uh, heavy uh, litigation and take have, have it possibly destroy their relationship. They want to get this, this, this dispute over and get on with their other relationships mm -hmm. with each other. And the public court system doesn't give them that opportunity. So that's why, um, that's why so many of them go into the private sector. It isn't even a matter of economics. They want an early resolution. Uh, it's similar to Federal District Court, as you know, has an early neutral evaluation program. Same sort of thing. They want early resolution, and the court system doesn't give it that. There's no way to get it. And I think it's a real deficiency, because what it means is that the, that the system, the court system, is not meeting the needs of the people who would otherwise use it. 
And that's partly when they leave to go. It isn't just the rich. It's because it's, they're going to seek what it is they need to solve their problem. And Why do you think the public courts haven't responded to that? Don, why do you think the public court system hasn't responded to this, this need that's out there? I don't think they understand it or recognize it. Uh, the, um, for many years, probably now 18 or 20 years, there's been a professor at Harvard Law School, Frank Sanders, who has advocated what he called the, the courthouse with many doors. You came into the system and you went through the door that fit your need. We just have one door in our court system. We try to make everybody fit. Everybody, to make everybody fit the system instead of having the system fit the need of the parties. Uh, it's a, um, I think it's mostly a factor of overload. Uh, I said earlier that uh, most judges are so overwhelmed by their workload they don't have time to think about other things. Um, but there's no question in my mind that that's what the need is there, and, and the court system ought to be doing it. I think that the um, settlement conferences don't are not the same because they're usually too directive, um, and also they're late in the game. They're usually so close to trial that so much money has been spent. Uh, uh, I remember when I was on the Superior Court, I was talking to one of the very best settlement judges we had, and he said the most difficult thing he had with the case and getting the case settled was because there was a million dollars had been paid in attorney's fees. Uh, and this was a case involving a, a, an auto manufacturer, so it wasn't somebody who didn't have money. Um, so I, I would hope that the system at, at some point would make that change, and, the, and the, the legislature, of course, knows nothing about this at all. So, um, and in fact, the, I think the minute you mentioned family law, up there everybody hides. but. Uh, the court system ought to recognize it, and I don't think they do. I don't think, for one thing, I don't think they realize how many cases there are that are getting out of the system to go to the private sector for that reason. Uh, tremendous number. I mean, if you've got in, in the San Francisco Jams office, if you've got 12 or 15 people who are working full time every day, a different case usually every day or maybe two days on a case, that's a lot of cases over a year. And they're, but they're providing the service that that case needs, and the public court system is not. And I think, as you say, it's not just family law, it's all civil. We see the Absolutely. civil cases we're getting here in the Court of Appeal are very different than they were eight years ago when I started Absolutely. Here. No, it's all, it's all, I exclude criminal, but it's all, all civil cases of all times. And I think at some point it'll change, but it requires, uh, uh, it's more than leadership, because I regard Ron George is a very good leader. Uh, I don't think he understands this either. I don't think anybody within the, the system understands it. I don't think they understand how much of this is going out. I don't think they understand why it goes out. I don't think they understand what the needs are. They look at the court system as being the business of trying the case that comes to trial. In all of those years that you were in the Court of Appeal, what kind of, what were the biggest changes you saw? We've seen a tremendous difference in the type of cases, I think, that we're seeing. Well, the biggest change we had was getting current, <laughs> because that was very discouraging. Uh, one of the problems when you had cases that had been tried five years before, in many instances, the law had changed. So um, it, it wasn't, and of course, it wasn't fair to the parties that, that five years later they were finally going to get an opinion. And did you say they were actually transferring cases out of the first district they had down done, to San Diego? Yeah, they had done that, and they they had uh, uh, they were talking about transferring more of them. And then when we came, then they stopped doing that. Um, I think the um, nothing much changed on the uh, criminal side in the years I was here. The three strikes came along, and there were there was a lot of uh, letting the dust settle on that in terms of what did it mean and how did it work. And so there were uh, some reversals uh, because it was some, something new and, and not fully understood how, mm -hmm. how, how to do it. 
But that, uh, I think the trial judge has picked up on that pretty well. And, uh, and, and, and of course, I think also the DAs and public defenders picked up on it well, so they were helping trial judges. Um, other than that, nothing much changed in the, um, on the uh, criminal side. On the civil side, um, I don't know. Uh, to me, one of the great benefits of the Court of Appeal, and that has nothing to do with the way the case has changed, but one of the great benefits was if you had good staff help, um, it allowed you not to ignore their work, but to spend more time on the cases you found to be most interesting. And that was a luxury. That was a real luxury. Did you have two attorneys in your chambers? I had two, time? and one of them was the best, I think, in the whole system. John Eisenberg, who's probably appeared before you now, he went to... And later became our lead attorney and then went into yeah. private practice. He, um, he was terrific. Uh, and, and, but the, I, I was always impressed with the uh, uh, attorney staff for the Court of Appeal here, and I think throughout the system. Did you write a lot of your own opinions? or? Or not? Um, yes. Uh, the reason I paused is that uh, on the criminal side, as you know, once there was a free attorney and a free appeal, and nothing worse could happen to you, there were uh, there was an appeal, which was which if it had been a civil appeal, we'd have imposed sanctions for a frivolous appeal. So I didn't spend much time on those. I'd, I'd look at the briefs. I always read the briefs in every case. I'd look at the briefs and I'd look at what the uh, staff person had done and recommended. Uh, but when you have a case like uh, a guy who's picked up a United Nations Plaza for selling drugs to an undercover agent and he, under the San Francisco system was his first offense, so they agreed to put him on probation for a period of time and not sell drugs. And then he's picked up two months later selling drugs at the United Nations Plaza to the same undercover agent. <laughs> and they provoke his parole, and he's appealing the revocation of his parole. Not a very weighty legal issue to deal with. Now, there certainly were some criminal cases that were uh, uh, weighty, and, we, and of course, we did have the, the ones that came that were, uh, um, were life without possibility of parole. Um, but, uh, and those you did spend more time on. But many of the many of the criminal cases did not have complex issues. Most, many more of the civil cases did, but there were a lot of civil cases that were fairly easy too. Uh, you'd get uh, a summary judgment granted that shouldn't have been granted because there were some material issues of fact or something like that. Mm -hmm. Again, it doesn't take a lot of work to do that. You have to understand what the record is and and, and the law, but. Uh, so it varied somewhat. Um, if you have g good staff and you can rely on them, and, you, and they are doing what they are supposed to do, it relieves you of a lot of a lot of the burden. You still have to work on every case, but working on my revocation of parole case really meant just reading the briefs and reading what had been prepared and saying this looks fine. Um, beyond that. Um, the more interesting, the, the more interesting the case was to me. The more I wrote the whole thing, uh, and the, and that's I said that's the luxury to have the time to do that with, with cases that have issues you're, you're interested in. So if you saw an interesting, let's say a family law case that, that was coming in with something new and different, yeah. you might have grabbed that yourself and. Uh, or at no, least spend it, a lot of time on did, it after. Yeah, yeah they yeah. just came. But we have cases. Uh, we had a case uh, uh, where a uh, I don't remember the name of the case, and it later went to the to the state supreme court. So our work kind of went for naught. In fact, we thought it should go to the U.S. Supreme Court. It was a case where the uh, the uh, head of a rental car uh, maintenance operation which had his Hispanic employees, was treating the Hispanic employees very badly, calling them names, all sorts of things. The trial judge had, uh, there, there'd been a verdict, a dollar verdict, in favor of the, uh, the uh, 
employees. And the uh, uh, trial judge had issued an injunction preventing this guy from making any further comments, similar comments. So it came to us, and it was a very interesting case because it was the question of free speech versus mm -hmm. harassment on the job. Uh, we reversed it. Uh, we reversed the injunction because uh, it wasn't specific enough. Uh, it didn't put the guy on enough warning as to what he would say. But we, uh, and that was the only issue that was appealed to us was that uh, the the damage thing they never never appealed. Um, it went to the Supreme Court. We we did it on a two to one decision. It was unusual in our division. We were almost always. Uh, together. I mean, I think I can almost count on one hand the number of times we had a dissent. But that we did have a dissent on. Clint Peterson was then our PJ. And uh, he was uh, purported to be the most conservative of the three of us, but he was the, he was in effect taking the most liberal issue because he dissented on the basis that this was a free speech issue. And Zern Haining and I ruled that, uh, in favor of the employees that this was a harassment uh, on the job issue. If it were sexual harassment or any other kind of harassment, if the employee has no ability to escape from it, uh, it's, then there's a, there has to be a remedy. And the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, never dealt with this issue, so that's why I thought we did, we mm -hmm. really went into it. We all spent a lot of time on that, and we had a wonderful, vigorous discussion amongst us, which was, again, something on the Court of Appeal I really loved. We had, if we were undecided on something or we had some differences, it was wonderful having those discussions. They were never heated. They were never uh, ones where anybody walked away mad or wasn't talking. Or mm -hmm. It was just a wonderful experience to engage in those kinds of discussions. I thought in many ways it was the best part of the job. Do you miss that now? Well, I do it some now still. I've got, I just finished a four-week arbitration where I'm chair of the panel, so I have to write the, the award. And it's the four of us, one, another retired judge and a lawyer has done a lot of arbitration. Um, all of us have concluded it's the toughest case we've ever had. We've had a very difficult time reaching a decision. We still haven't finally reached it totally, but I think we're almost there. It involves statute of limitations issues, and it's a real estate fraud case. Um, so uh, I, I do have it there. It's reliving the Court of Appeal experience. And again, it's really good. We have good discussions. We started off with three different positions, and I think we've now come pretty much to one, uh, at least on the liability issue. Um, so there's still some opportunity for that, but uh, as each of the three of us said, uh, in some ways we're constrained where there are three of us. And I think, but I think it's a good constraint on a big case. And it's a good reason why people take three arbitrators instead mm -hmm. of a sole arbitrator. If I was doing this as a sole arbitrator, I would have had no problem making the decision. But you start dealing with others and they raise this issue and that issue, and it leads to wonderful discussion. Uh, we've had to ask the parties. Normally, you have to get an award out within 30 days. We've asked the parties for an extension. We brought them back in for argument, further argument. I mean, it's really was much more akin to the Court of Appeal than anything else I've done. Even the other cases in which I've been on, on the panel mm -hmm. uh, have not had this sort of thing because we've kind of ended up pretty much with a consensus. But it, it is, uh, to me, it was, the, it was the most wonderful part of the Court of Appeal uh, experience, having those uh, discussions before and after oral argument. Oral argument. In your retirement, uh, what are you doing besides all this work? Are you traveling? Or? Some, some travel, uh, but I, I love what I'm doing. I, retirement's supposed to be to do what you like to do, so, uh, and I'm, uh, I've got as much work as I want and more than my wife wants. <laughs> and uh, as I said earlier, she's now limiting my jurisdiction so that I don't get out, out of the Bay Area because uh, she doesn't like me to be gone for, uh, I have one remaining two-week arbitration in Los Angeles. and she, that's a long Go, time. She's going crazy. So, uh, and that's okay in some ways. It's uh, fine with me. Uh, I like dealing. I found the legal culture is so different in Southern California that I've enjoyed being down there and uh, being exposed to that. It really is like a different world. Is 
Yeah. Yeah. And both in family law and in, uh, in uh, other things. I, I've been doing some cases for the top family law lawyers down there. They're very good, but they just operate in a very different way. It's a much more adversarial system than it is up there. That's interesting. I wonder why that is. I think there's just too many lawyers, and they don't know each other. Uh, e even among the family law, I mean, here in, in, the, in San Francisco, there are uh, maybe 10 or 15 lawyers who handle those kinds of cases. In LA, there probably are 50. They don't deal with each other that much. But uh, somehow it's more than that. I don't know. It's just a much more adversarial mm. atmosphere down there. Maybe it's the having to travel on those crowded freeways. Mm. Or, <laughs> Must have been a bad mood to begin yeah, with. Yeah, that's right. You still running? And, and no, my my knees gave out. Did uh, they? And now I now I try to go for a long walk with the dog every day, if uh, at least in the one that's still light when I get through. Mm -hmm. And I I do do that every day if I can. Any thoughts of a, a real retirement at some point? Yes, um, we're planning on moving into a live care place up in uh, Santa Rosa. We have a second home in Healdsburg. Oh, I didn't know that. On the river. So we would sell our home in San Francisco, keep the one up there, and then move into this uh, place in Santa Rosa. And we're on a waiting list. There's a three-year wait, so that kind three of sets years? the timetable. Uh, but I think uh, I'm hopeful within another year or two we'll make that adjustment. And then I may either totally retire from the law, or I may figure out, try to figure out some way to help the Sonoma Superior Court well, that come in occasionally and help them. I'm sure they would love that. Uh, I don't think I'd want to sit on assignment, but I, I want to try to help them do settlement conferences or something mm -hmm. like that. That would be great. Well, are there any areas that we've missed that you would like to talk about, either about your profession or? Well, um, you know, I. So many people do so many things for which they don't get recognition, and I have gotten so much more than my share. I was going to say, there's actually something here I skipped, which was all of these awards you've gotten yeah. over the years, if there were any of those that really were most significant. And I'm still you. getting some occasionally. I mm -hmm. just got one by the Association of Certified Family Law Specialists this year. Uh, no, they're wonderful. Uh, I, I was the first non-Los Angeles person recently to get an award, their annual award from the, for the family law bar down there. That was two or three years ago. I think the topper was the uh, the state bar every year. The family law committee gives a award to the trial judge of the year. And uh, the the uh, when I retired, they named that award after me. So that was really special. That's really special. Really special. But it's I've just been so fortunate because I've gotten so much recognition and uh, as I say a lot of people do a lot of things and don't get much at all so it's been wonderful. Yeah, we'll always think of you as the king of family law. <laughs> Jim Levy's comment he this is quoting him the other day said that one of the things he thought always characterized your decisions was your understanding of and an empathy with the human condition and your willingness to discuss that in cases and he always appreciated that. Yeah. And yeah, I think that's very true. Well, it's there, and I think, unfortunately, in the, the legal system, too often we, we overlook it. We get so focused on uh, damages or so focused on who did what that uh, we don't think enough about that. And I, I, I do think that uh, our role, certainly in the family law field, maybe juvenile also, ought to be to help people. And we don't help them by making them fight. Well, Don, we really appreciate all your time today. I know when you finally do really retire, we're going to miss you tremendously if you get out of family law completely. You've made a great contribution over the well, years. thank you. You'll certainly be remembered again as, as being the, one of the leaders, I think, in the family law field. Well, now that Rudder Group has bought my name, it will we go know on you'll forever. be around forever. <laughs> thank you, Don. Okay.